one knew it at the time, but 160 years ago today was the high watermark of McClellan's Peninsula Campaign. This would be his last offensive operation at the gates of Richmond. Today is the anniversary of the Battle of uh, Hanover Courthouse, and like so many of McClellan's other battles, he is absent. <laughs> that does seem to be a trend, doesn't it, Candace? Hi, I am Candace Hart. I am one of the rangers here at uh, Richmond National Battlefield Park, and we are collaborating and working on videos to bring you around uh, Richmond for the Peninsula Campaign. By late May, the Federal Army is arrayed along the swampy, malaria-infested Chickahominy River ominously close to the Confederate capital of Richmond. McClellan is expecting significant reinforcements to arrive any day now from the direction of Fredericksburg. So he's watching his northern flank rather carefully. I think he might have been watching a little too carefully. McClellan overreacts and he bites on a rumor from a Virginia civilian who reports that 15,000 rebel troops are marching north toward Mechanicsville to intercept McDowell's Union. Uh, the rumor was partially true. Partially true. The Confederates were moving north, but it wasn't 15,000 troops. It was only 4,000. And they weren't moving to intercept McDowell or threaten McClellan's flank. General Lawrence O'Brien Branch was really just going to babysit the railroad. The rebels weren't looking for trouble, but McClellan was about to give them a nasty surprise. He orders his favorite corps commander, Fitz John Porter, to take his entire corps, some 12,000 men, on a march in a driving rainstorm to find this phantom rebel army. Today, Porter and Branch find themselves at Hanover Courthouse, and it is a complete surprise for both men. It is, uh, but the surprise is on the worse end for Branch. He does not realize that he is actually not up against a federal division. He's up against an entire federal corps. The Battle of Hanover Courthouse is a quick, confusing affair. There's little tactical finesse on either side, and the rebels are ultimately routed. This little battle may not be a tactical masterpiece, but it does give McClellan's favorite new corps commander, Fitz John Porter, his first real chance to shine in a battle. And it's impossible to deny that of the generals in the Army of the Potomac, it's Porter who will consistently display the most potential throughout this campaign. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is everybody's kind of on the job training. No one has done the job of Corps Command before in a war of this size and scale. So really, nobody has any more experience at fighting a Civil War battle than anybody else. Some people do have more potential experience. You look at McClellan's resume, it looks great. When the rubber beats the road with, with Porter, you know, in this uh, campaign of 1862, um, not many people do better on the field uh, than he does. This is a time when, you know, everybody's at an equal level of inexperience. Seven days battles are going to give everybody the chance to kind of learn and succeed or fail on the go and uh, generals on both sides are going to clean house. They're going to discover that they had people that just were not capable and you've got to get them out and rotate through. Keep putting people in the job till you find somebody who knows what they're doing. So Porter is a good example of somebody who shows up and does exactly what he needs to do um, and is as successful as he could be uh, in this campaign. So. Interestingly, of course, he ends up out of the army for other reasons. While the army is struggling to find capable, high-level commanders, they've got one, but for other reasons, he's not going to be uh, permitted to continue that job. Um, Porter is somebody who is sort of a fascinating, you know, what if, that as you're looking in the first years of the war to find anybody who has some combat leadership capability, um, that he does show that potential very well in his performance at Gaines Mill and Malvern Hill. But Gaines Mill and Malvern Hill are yet to come. 160 years ago today, Hanover Courthouse allows Porter to show a brief flash of his future potential. But today's impact on McClellan will be far greater. Today's small battle keeps McClellan laser-focused on his northern flank. His letters and reports during the week are filled with constant worry about Stonewall Jackson swooping down and catching his northern flank by surprise. Hanover Courthouse only serves to narrow McClellan's tunnel vision in the wrong direction. Because while General McClellan is distracted with what is happening on his right flank, General Joseph E. Johnston is planning an attack straight at McClellan's front. 
Join us in just a few days at Little Wars TV and at Richmond National Battlefield Park as we explore that decisive moment of what is chaos and mayhem at Seven Pines.